Ashkoch HaPratis in the matter that Rabbi Jacobson was not able to make it here last second. Ashkoch HaPratis that Rabbi Shachat has been down with us the past two days. We thank him for our last moment coming over and agreeing to bring with us, to hear us a little bit, Talmud and Mirat Taylor, in honor of the day of Yudshat. Please give your proper terecheres. Please rise for Rabbi Yudshat. <laughs> But nevertheless, there's always a certain act and element of Ashkoch HaPratis, and that came about just this morning when Rabbi Greenberg called me and said to me that, I'm sorry, that um, your speaker isn't able to be here. Of course, we wish him a full shalem, but if I don't mind to come in instead. But I have to tell you something. Yes, I had the schus, and I can only describe it as a schus to have davened here in the last two days, because it was a very, very, very long time since I davened with any yeshiva, with any cheder, or anything like that. I davened in my own shul, and it's a shul of balabatim. And balabatim means by definition that they're businessmen, and that shachar starts at 10 to 7 in the morning, and that the train across the street leaves at 7.25. So that's the window in which you have to start and finish davening. So coming in here yesterday, and even before I was coming in here this morning, but after having davened here yesterday, this morning I was on the phone to speak to my family in London, to say good Shabbos, etc., before coming in, because they're eight hours ahead. And the first thing I said was, wow, what an experience. Where, where are you davening? I said, I'm davening here in the Cheder. I said, oh, what an experience. What a difference. I said, not just a difference between how you daven over here and how they might daven in my shul, but the difference b'chalal and how we daven in Chabad, or anywhere else, than anywhere else for that matter. Because, and that's the first thing I said, I said the Chayas, the Lebedekite, that goes into everything, I said in any Cheder, in any Yeshiva, of course, there's a certain kind of Lebedekite that goes into learning and what have you. But, by us in Chabad, the Lebedekite goes into absolutely everything. The davening, not just the learning, the davening, the hanhaga, and everything else, the tzayim, everything that we do is done with a chayis, is done with a love of the kite. You know, when the Friedrich Rebbe first came to America, and he made that famous statement that we will all know, he said, America is nicht anders, America won't be any different, mach da Eretz Yisrael, that we will make America itself into Eretz Yisrael. At one point he was staying in a particular small hotel. And some Balabatim were coming to see him, to visit him, to greet him, to welcome him to the United States. And when they came in, they came to his room and they had a private audience and they said to him, so everything you do is wonderful. The Mesir Snefesh that you demonstrated in Russia is fantastic. Your plans for what you want to do over here in America is beautiful, but why Hasidus? What is Hasidus adding? Why do we need the extra? We have halacha, we have gemara, we have our usual davening, whatever it is. Why chassidus? So the Prince have asked him a simple question. What did you see when you came into the hotel? So we, what did we see? We saw, I don't know, the lobby. We saw the reception. We saw the front desk. We saw the receptionist. And they asked, we asked for directions. And they told us about how to go up the stairs and find our way to your room. And here we are. And the Prince have said, yes, but did you also see that beautiful chandelier that was hanging in the lobby with the wonderful crystals and the light glittering off the crystals and bouncing around the room. They didn't pay attention to that. And the Friedrich Rebbe made a point and says, that's what Chassidus is. The reception, the lobby, the area, all of that, that's, that you get everywhere. But Chassidus is the chandelier, those beautiful crystals and the light from that chandelier being reflected into everything else that you otherwise take for granted. That's the Chayas, that's the Lebedekai, that's what Yud Shvat is all about. The light and the extra 
Hasidish kite that gets put into everything that we do, making it an altogether different experience. So for me, just yesterday and today, davening here, that in itself was, was an uplifting experience. There was a young boy whose parents were going to be taking him into Yechidus by the Rebbe. And in that day and age, that boy, who was going to go into Yechidus with his older sister, that was very exciting. Today maybe we need other things to make us excited, but in those days there were no distractions. Everything was just very simple in life, and it was exciting to be able to go to Yechidus for the Rebbe, by the Rebbe. And it was the boy's first time, and his older sister's first time. And amongst the many things that his parents were telling him, and getting him all excited about going into this Yechidus, was that he's going to get a bracha from the Rebbe. Because anyone who went into Yechidus by the Rebbe always got a bracha, just as anybody who ever went by the Rebbe for dollars, etc., etc. So he's excited about this. The Rebbe's going to give him a bracha. A bench. That's the way the parents put it. But there's only one problem. In this boy's mind, a bracha is something different. You know, when the Rebbe gave a bracha, of course, the Rebbe would look at you, you'd ask the Rebbe what you needed or whatever it is, and the Rebbe would give you a bracha. The Rebbe would express to you and say to you, bracha ba'atzlacha, whatever it is, giving you a bracha verbally for whatever it is that you needed, that you wanted. But to this little boy, the idea of a bracha was something different. Many people have a minig, it's a universal minig, that on a Friday, that on, on Erev Yom Kippur, we give Bercha Sabonim, right? You put your hand sometimes on the head of the child, and you say, Yibrach Hashem Yishmerecha, etc., etc. This boy and his family, they used to do this every single Friday night. So every Friday night, some people have that minig, that every single Friday night, not just on Erev Yom Kippur, they do Bercha Sabonim where the parents put their hands on the heads of the child and they say, Yisimcha l'kim k'efrayim v'chem enashe, yibrecha shem v'yishmerecha, etc., etc. That was the understanding of this boy when he was told he's going to get a bracha by the Rebbe. So he's in Yechidus with his older sister and his mother and his father and the whole Yechidus takes place and of course the Rebbe gave the boy a bracha as he will have given everybody else and then the Yechidus is over and they start to leave the Rebbe's room. And what does this little boy do? He sits down on the floor and starts to cry. Why? Because he didn't get a bracha, as far as he's concerned. So, he looks to the rabbi, the father, the rabbi looks to the father, and the rabbi asks the father, why is this boy crying? Why is your son crying? And the rabbi, the, boy, the father didn't know at first, the mother, the mother said, because as far as he's concerned, he didn't get a bracha, because that's his understanding of a bracha. So the rabbi first made a light comment to the father and said something something about bringing new customs into Chabad, Chabad. and then the Rebbe called the little boy over to the side of his table and put Yodah HaKadosha on the boy's head and gave him the bracha, Yibrocha HaKshem Yishmerach, etc. And then, then the Rebbe told the father afterwards that when you leave the Yechidus, don't tell anybody else about the story. Because I don't want other people to be jealous. You know, other people are going to start asking for the same thing. It's not the done thing, so just keep it to yourself. And that was that. So the question is, how do I know the story? Because it happened to me. But then the question is, so why am I retelling the story? Now you haven't got an answer. Yeah, but if the directive was given to my father not to tell the story, then maybe I shouldn't be telling it either. And yet, the truth of the matter is, the importance of the story today is because of the bigger story it tells. Just think about this for a second. It's about 1.30 in the morning, okay? There are many, many more people still waiting outside to go into Yechidus, because Yechidus used to go on almost all night. And very often, you know, it's a little boy sitting on the floor and a little boy crying, and you can picture that situation and that scenario in so many other different instances. And it'd usually be a case of, okay, give the kid a little candy, get him off the floor, get him out of my room, let's go, let's move on, no more people waiting. But as a Yiddish convict, when there's a Jewish child crying, for the Rebbe, that became the whole focal point of the world. Everything else stops. The world stops. Right now, as a Yiddish kid vain, if there's a Jewish child sitting there crying, then the Rebbe makes that his only concern and asks but one question, Fabos Vainter, why is he crying? And then, 
and even more so, the Rebbe did something and will do something that is so totally out of the ordinary. Not something that would ever otherwise have ever been done. Just to do what is necessary to be able to do away with the child's tears, to make the child stop crying. And that is exactly the same challenge that the Rebbe gave every single one of us on Yud Shvat, Tov Shin Yud Aleph. When the Rebbe instructed every single one of us to do exactly the same, when the Rebbe said that yes, there is Abbas Hashem, the way you love the Eivishter, the way you daven with your chayas, that's important, that's extremely important. There's Abbas Satayro, there's the way you're going to love your learning and put yourself and your chayas into your learning, nigla, chassidus, etc., as you do here every single day, that's also important. And then there's Abbas Abbas Yisrael, loving every single other person. And the point that the Rebbe made then, which is, of course, as important today, is that if you have Abba Sashem and you have Abba Satayra and you're learning with Chayas and you're davening with Chayas and you have all of that Chassidish Chayat and all of that Lebedic Chayat, but you don't have your Abba Yisrael, you don't concern yourself with Babas Vainter, why there's another Jewish child crying, then you need to know that your Abba Sashem and your Abba Satayra, it's not so ay ay ay. It's not going to necessarily hold up. Because all three are very important. And if you think about that video camera right there at the back, it's standing on a tripod on three legs. Avas Hashem, Avas Atayra, and Avas Yisrael. You take away one leg and it falls down. And that's the way it works with every single one of us. I don't know if you know this story. The story is told about an elder of Chassid. His name was Rabbi Ram Zaltzman. And he was once sitting in Eretz Yisrael, out of Habrengen, and he was telling over a story that happened to him many years ago. This is a number of years ago. He was sitting with Remendel Futifas. I'm sure you've heard of Remendel Futifas. I personally had the opportunity of, he used to live in London, so I had the opportunity of spending many a Shabbos with him some years ago. And Avram Zalzman was telling over a story about how he himself was with a group of other young boys learning in Lubavitch, Shimba Lubavitch, in the old original Lubavitch. Some boys were not so into their learning all of the time. So they were encouraged to go and do other things like help out in the little with the farm animals and etc. And one day the boys decided to have some fun. And they took a goat and they decided to open the doors to the Zal and let the goat run in. Now what do you think Rabbi Greenbaum would do if you let a goat run loose over here, suddenly in the middle of learning? Attention! Right. You can imagine, at the time, this was at the time of the Rebbe Roshah, the Friedrich Rebbe was then like the Mashkiach in the Yeshiva. They let a goat run loose in the Zal in the middle of learning, so it ran wild, it made a mess, etc., etc. It didn't take an hour before the Friedrich Rebbe rounded up the boys and kicked them out of the yeshiva, just like that. And if that's what you're going to do when you're going to disturb the learning, etc., we don't, we don't behave like that to Lubavitch. It doesn't happen. Out. And so they started to leave. And they're standing on the train platform over there, not, and they're sitting there thinking to themselves. And a couple of them thought, okay, forget it. It's all over. We've been kicked out. We're going home. And Rabbi Zaltzman himself turned to one of his friends and said, you know, you know, we can't give up. We didn't even put up an argument. We didn't even put up a fight to just try and stay. Maybe we can plead our case, apologize, do something so that we would be able to stay in the yeshiva. So two of them, Rabbi Zaltzman and his friend, went back. The others left. Now what are they supposed to do? To go to the Rashab? That's impossible. You don't get into the Rebbe. To go to the Friedeker Rebbe was then the Mashkiach. He was too angry. There was no way trying to plead their case with him. But they had a different idea. Maybe they'll go to the Rashab's mother, Rabbi Sinrifka, who was at the time almost like the mother of all the Bokhim, the Yeshiva. She'd help them out when they needed help, etc. Speak to her. Maybe we can do something. Maybe she can help us. So they went to her. And Rabbi Ram Zalzman looked to her and told her exactly what was wrong and how upset he was and how sorry he was. And is there something you can advise us? What can we do? So she said, look, there's nothing I can do, and I don't interfere in the running of the yeshiva, but in the morning, there's always tea brought in to the rush up, and maybe when that tea is brought in, if you're there at the door, you can take the immediate opportunity to just, I don't know, plead your case, beg, do something. 
So Kachava, the next morning, that's where they were. They were by the Rashab's doorway, and the tea was being brought in. And the Rabram was standing there, and the Rashab looked at him, and he asked him, what's wrong? What do you want? So he told him, he says, I, I you know, we bumped out of the yeshiva, the Rashab were already hurt. He says, I feel I've been Lubavitch. I want to stay here, in this yeshiva. And the Rashab looked at him and started to tell him, why do you have to be here? You can go to Slabotka, you can go to, you start to list off all the different other yeshivas that he can go to around. Why do you need to stay here? So he said, because I want to be here, I want to stay here, I want to learn to this. So the Roshab said to him, well, why is it so important to you? And he started to cry. He said, because that's what's important to me. That's who I am. That's what I am. I am a Chabad Chassid. I want to stay here. And he started to cry bitterly. And as he was crying, the Roshab started to smile. And the more the Roshab was smiling, the more he was crying, feeling that that's it. His case isn't even being answered to. And then finally, after a while, the Roshab got very serious and said to him, I'll think about it. I'll let you know. And then he started to leave. And as he started to leave the Roshab's room, he remember he had a friend over there. So he turned around to the Roshab and he, the Roshab said, Boshe invite here. What else do you want? So he says, I have a friend. He said, yeah, I'm asking for him too. The Roshab said to him, all right, that's the friend. You have a friend. We'll think about him also. The story has a happy ending because in the end, with a very stiff knas, very big fine of However many blood Gemara they had to learn about Peh, and however many Maimonim they had to learn about Peh, they were allowed back into the yeshiva. And that's the way he told over the story. And when he's sitting at this Fabrengian in Kfar Chabad telling over the story, Reb Mendel Futzifas said to him, Reb Avram Zog L'chaim, he said, say L'chaim. So he said, big L'chaim. And he said to him, now, let me ask you a question. Why do you think that the Rashab lets you back into the yeshiva? So he says, says, what do you mean? It's obvious. Why do you think the Rashab let him back into Yeshiva? Because he's crying, he's begging, he's pleading. I, 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 want, I, have, I want to learn Chassidus, I want to demonstrate it. Chassidus, Chassidus, Chassidus. And Reb Mendel looked at him and said, no, that's not why the Rashab let you back in Yeshiva. He let you back in because just as you were about to leave, you turned around and you said, I have a friend. And that's key. That's what it's all about. It's all about understanding that you have a friend. And that all the learning itself is important and all the chassidus is important and it is who you are. But it's not enough if you're just going to keep it to yourself and you're not going to share it with somebody else as well. So I'm going to leave you with this final little thought. This week's Pasha, we read all about Amalek. And we find how it's ready this week's Pasha, it's ready again also in Pasha's Kisaitzen. And we know that Moshe Rabbeinu appointed Boon to go out to say, Yilok and Boon, Moshe Rabbeinu sent to go and fight against Amalek. Yahishua, Dafka Yahishua. And who was Amalek actually attacking? Kol HaNechashalam HaKarecha, the ones who were outside of the cloud. Why were they not being protected by the Anani HaKavay? Because they were more the sinners. And they were the ones, therefore, who were more vulnerable, and that's who Amalek was able to try and attack. And yet in this week's Parsha, Yahishua went and took we took together a whole bunch of able-bodied men, and where did they go? They Dafka went outside the cloud to go and fight with and against Amalek. Why did it have to Dafka be Yahushua and not Moshe himself? Because Yahushua comes from Ephraim. Ephraim is a son of Yaisef. Yaisef and Semach Tzedek told us is Yaisef Hashem Li Ben Acher. Shid Rachel didn't just say, Yosef Hashem Li Ben, the Ebeshter gave me another son, or gave me a son. But Yosef Hashem Li Ben Acher, the Ebeshter gave me an Acher, an opportunity to reach out to somebody who might otherwise be conceived or perceived as an Acher, as somebody outside the cloud, and to bring him back in, and to make him a Ben, make him a son. That's why it was Dafka Yahishua, who came from Ephraim, who came from Yosef, who has that unique ability. And that's the challenge again. That the Friedrich Rebbe and the Rebbe gave every single one of us, that's what Yitzchak is all about. You know that bracha the Rebbe gave me? What's the middle word of the bracha? Count. Yar Hashem Panav Eilecha. Stop there. Now leave out the Bichon Eka. Yisro Hashem Panav Eilecha V'yasim L'cha Shalem. Seven words on one side, seven words on the other. The middle word is Bichon Eka. Turn around the letters of Bichon Eka and you get Chinuch. You know how you become gebenched in life? You know how you get brachas? By bringing brachas to other people. You become gebenched in life, you become blessed yourself through the own chinuch that you experience in a cheder chabad. And you become even more gebenched and more blessed in life when you take that chinuch out to somebody else. You go out to that acher and you make him a ben. And it's precisely through doing all of that
chinuch for yourself through the chandelier and the light that's going on in your life through the chesidus and bringing it out to the other person by always stopping and caring enough, even amongst yourselves, to ask for Abbas Venter, why is he crying? Why does he look sad? What can I do to make him happy? That's the challenge that the Fidik Rebbe that gave us. That's what the Yitzvah is all about. And doing that is going to make still this Yitzvah, the ultimate Yitzvah, what we'll be celebrating together with the Fidik Rebbe, with the Rebbe, with Moshiach Tzedkenu, with Peter Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Abishachat. Thank you, Tommy. Then before Abishachat steps away from this area, I just want to take an opportunity to thank him, not just with words, but we said everything's a Kach Pratis. The fact that Abishachat was willing to come at a moment's notice, almost, almost a moment's notice, to come share a very, very inspiration to bring with us. I'd like to present Abishachat with a set, the entire set of the Bracha Vatzlacha books that are produced here at Cheder every single year. So every year between Mishra and Mishra, for this approximately, Hamid and Cheder collect stories from the family members of theirs um, that happen with the Rebbe or the Hidika Rebbe or with anything associated with the Rebbe. And they publish it in a book called Bracha Batzlacha. It's been for the past seven years and seven books have been produced. As a matter of fact, in last year's Cheder, Seven, as I am. Last year's Rachel um, Slava book, on page 137, no, on page 135, we have a story by Abraham Shachat called To Be Blessed. A young couple once went to the Rebbe Yechidus, etc., etc., which actually also helps us here because many times when you hear a story from someone, or someone writes down a story, you say, ah, is it accurate? Is it not accurate? And then later you meet the person with whom the story happened and you hear the story told over. And then you see that in the book it was printed almost verbatim the same way it was told over, that means to say that there is a good chance that the rest of the stories in the book as well are pretty much fact-checked very well, and I would like to present Rabbi Shachat with an entire set of these seven volumes of Bracha Batzlacha in gratitude for coming here to join us He now has a lot of reading material for a long flight back to London, and his community is going to be hearing a lot of other stories over the course of the next uh, couple of years, Bezaz Hashem. So we thank him very, very much. And we encourage Tommy to remember, we're coming to Yitzvah now. We're about to start working on publishing the next volume, volume 8, the Bracha Tzlacha. Please take that time to gather these stories from your family members. It's a tremendous opportunity. People from all over the world call us in Cheder every year, asking for copies of this books so that they can have the inspiration that we all get from these stories that so many of them perhaps would not be known, such as this story, um, if not for the printing of these sparks. Kindleach boys, please reach out to your family members and bring those stories in as soon as you can so we can go to print as Hashem in the month of other with the I next volume of Rachel Akslava. Thank you very much for the shot.